Hey, I'm Joshua, the pastor at Bethel Community Church, and our church has been going through the book of Genesis, and we're asking, where do we see the glory of Christ in each of the days of creation? Uh, we get this from the New Testament, where it says that all the scriptures point to Christ, and where St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that people can see the attributes of God from those things which are made, that God's word created the, uh, the, the world and creation, and that the creation story actually also must points us to the glory of God and in the person of Christ. And so uh, day three, what is it about the third day of creation that points us to, to Christ? What can we learn from Christ on that day? Uh, first of all, two things happen on day three. One thing happened on day one, one thing happened on day two. But when we get to day three, uh, two things happen, just like uh, what will happen on day six. And in day three, two things happen, uh, both of which point to the resurrection. The first is that God pulls out of the watery depths. He pulls out dry land. Uh, before that, uh, he, there on the earth, um, he had already separated the, the sky. He did that on day two. But uh, on the third day, he pulls out uh, dry land that, that can face the sunshine. No longer is uh, the water, which had been earlier in the chapter, was called the, the, the dark uh, depths. You know, all of a sudden there is land that can face the, uh, the light and see the light of the glory of God. That happens on day one. There is something solid. It is not all chaotic and muddy and murky, but there is something solid. And so often throughout the uh, psalm, salvation, God's salvation is pointed to this idea of, you know, he pulled me up out of the watery depths and set my feet uh, upon the rock. And though that can happen in my life and your life, God can deliver us from uh, dark and troubling circumstances. Ultimately, we see that in the resurrection of Christ, where God pulls him out of depth and out of the tomb and, and, and sets his feet, not just upon a rock, but uh, upon an eternal throne of heaven. But it just doesn't stop there with the pulling up of the land up out of the uh, ocean. He, he, then God speaks to the ground. He speaks to the ground. He says, bring forth bring forth life and he, he, he brings forth, you know, uh, grass and herbs and fruit trees and vegetation and, and he, this uh, light, this land that God had called forth, he now covers it in life. We, we serve a living God and all of creation, you know, it was formless and void. Well, the first three few days, you know, God is taking this formlessness and he's he's forming it but then the last three days he's kind of filling it so it's no longer void it's no longer empty but it, it's filled with life he kind of gives it the bones and then later in the week he, he's kind of fleshing it out he now speaks life and and the word you keep finding it's used four times just in those couple verses the word seeds it's a, which when you study particularly hebrew literature whenever th something's repeated that's like putting it in all caps or underlining it or putting in an exclamation mark. He's talking about the, the seeds of the herbs and the seeds of the fruit trees and the fruit that has the, the, the seed in it. And again, he just didn't speak these into existence. He spoke to the ground and said, bring forth, you know, bring forth these things with seeds. So, well, how does this point us to the resurrection of Christ? Well, in a couple of ways, uh, just the command, bring forth, might remind you of when Jesus was at his friend Lazarus' tomb in John chapter 11. And, you know, he had been dead for several days. And what does he do? He says, you know, Come forth, just that command, come forth, up out of the ground, come forth into life. And God speaks to the seeds, come, bring forth, come forth into life and, and, and bear fruit. But that's not the only thing. It's the reason this word seed is emphasized. It, it, the word seed is actually used six times in Genesis chapter one, four times in these couple verses, and then twice more uh, towards the end of the chapter. But it is used a seventh time. And a lot of Things are repeated seven times in the creation account. Uh, you know, the word light is used seven times in those in the first day of creation when God makes light. And then the word water is used, you know, seven times when uh, God makes, uh, you know, s separating the, the waters. But, but here it, with the word seed, it's used six times there, but the seventh time does not come until the very end of the creation narrative where after men and women, Adam and Eve sin, and God pronounces judgment upon the serpent. And the seventh time he uses the word seed. And it says the woman's seed will, will crush your head. That seventh time is reserved for a prophecy that's going to point forward to Jesus, who is the true seed. And we see this theme of seed all throughout the Bible about, he, you know, God speaks to Abraham, through your seed will the nations be blessed. And he speaks to David and your seed will sit on a throne that will last forever. And of course, Christ comes. He is the true seed. And Christ comes. And what do seeds need to do? They need to die and be buried. And then if they die and they're buried, they, they bear much fruit. And on which day was Christ raised? 
Which day? Why does it say, according to the scriptures, that Christ needed to be raised on the third day? Why? Because Genesis chapter 1 tells us that it's on the third day that seeds are raised. It's on the third day that seeds brought forth out of the ground into new life. Uh, third day is the day of resurrection. And we see it in Genesis 1. We see it in the gospel accounts. Okay, uh, there you go. That is the third day of creation. Uh, we're going to be doing each one of these days. If you want to hear more, please, I don't know, like, subscribe, and, uh, you know, or send me a, a letter by pigeon carrier. And if it gets here, you know, in time, maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll add you to our mailing list. Um, and or if, also, if you want to leave a comment and it's sufficiently nasty and mean, uh, I might even get around to replying to it. Anyway, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to do more days, so please follow on. Love to hear your thoughts. How do you see the glory of God and the glory of Christ in uh, these creation accounts? God bless.